want to talk about things that have involved really the use of routinely collected statistics in some cases and special epidemiological studies in other cases. So I want to just illustrate results that can come from these things. I'm looking to the past, not the future. And I'm going to concentrate on premature death. It's not the only thing that matters. Speaking at the age of 78, I'm 79 this month. Um, death before age 70 isn't the only thing that matters, but death before age 70 on average matters more than death after age 70. And so, you know, you can't live forever, but you can reduce the risk of dying before 70. And because the slides are going to be a permanent record, I've just put references to a few of the things I'm going to say. Okay, so death before 70. Well, how many deaths before 70 do we have in the world? Well, at present, these are numbers for 2010, but the numbers for 2020 aren't very different except for COVID. So at 2010 death rates, um, there were about 53 million deaths, about 53 million deaths in 2010. And that included 30 million deaths at age 0 to 69. And that 30 million is going to stay fairly constant apart from the odd war or epidemic um, from 2010 until 2030. Because although overall death rates among people of a given age are going down, so death rates among children are going down, death rates in middle age are going down, but the population is going up. And just by coincidence, between the period 2010 and 2030, those two things cancel out and it's going to stay at about 30 million deaths a year from 2010 to 2030, as I say, apart from the effects of nuclear war and um, pandemics. And those deaths, those 30 million deaths, um, are, well, 18 million in what I'll call middle age, that's halfway between noughts and 70. You can define middle age how you like. Um, and then 12 million before middle age, 7 million under five deaths, about 5 million deaths at ages 5 to 34. And this includes accidents and violence. I mean, you know, about a million deaths from suicide, about a million deaths from traffic and so on. This is all deaths from any cause. And in those days, it was only about half a million deaths from war. Um, and so can we halve these numbers? What can be done to halve these numbers of deaths? Well, one thing that's pushing up, as I say, is population growth. So if we could reduce the, the death rate, we will we will actually, if we, we've got to continue reducing the death rate to keep the number down to 30 million, which is population growth alone will take it up to about 45 million a year by 2030. Okay, and I'm going to give a few examples, just selected examples, using just ordinary descriptive statistics. And the first obvious descriptive statistic is just mortality in particular countries. And I want to look at the UK. And what I'm going to do, I want to concentrate on two particular things, tobacco and alcohol. Um, not because they're the only causes of premature death, but because Sarah Lewington, who follows what I'm going to say, will talk about various other major causes of premature death, death, particularly death in middle age. So I want to look at the UK mortality rates in 1960 um, and in 2010, 50 years later. And I want you to just note how the risks have changed. The risk of death before age five has changed and how the risk of death before age 70 has changed. They've changed a lot for the better, much more for the better than people think. So here we have UK, the bottom line is, and this is males, I'm doing males because in 1960, UK males had the worst death rates in the world from tobacco. And at age five, what's the property of dying before age five? Well, it was about 4%. So 4% of the kids born at UK in 1960 um, would die before they're five. Now, worldwide mortality, under five mortality nowadays, is about 4%. That's true worldwide for the whole world. So Britain, meantime, has gone down to about 0.4%. But so where we were, where Britain was in 1960, is where the whole world is now in terms of under five mortality. The changes have just been enormous. Now, death before 70, as you can see, at 1960 death rates, half the kids in Britain at 1960 death, 1960 death rates would be dead before they were 70, at least half the males. And that's gone down, that went down to about 21%, it's now about 18%. And the main reason it went down was because back in 1960, we had the world's worst tobacco death rates. And over the next 50 years, we had the world's best decrease in tobacco deaths. Well, of course, it's easy to have the best decrease if you start off with worst death rates. It's a bit of a cheat. But anyway, so and if, if you look, these things look like cigarettes, but they're not. Um, this is just the probability that you're going to, that a man aged 35 is going to die before age 70. 
And back at 1960, death rate was 42%. And 23 of those 42 deaths, just over half of them, were tobacco deaths. That's in the whole population. This is not death rates of smokers. That's the death rates of males in Britain. And by 2010, that had gone down to 19%, with five of those 19 deaths due to smoking. So it's still the biggest cause of premature death we've got. And the good news is that it used to be much worse. And you see the main thing was driving the death rates down in Britain. So now, because the death rates in males have gone down so much, now women live only about four years longer than men, still both are male and female. Tobacco is responsible for about a quarter of the cancer deaths. I mean, it's hitting, but it's hitting both sectors much more equally now. So, you know, we've now got much lower death rates in males and the females never did have the high death rates for tobacco because they didn't smoke as much. But if women smoke like men, they die like men. So these are 2010 death rates, male and female. Okay, so that's one particular thing. Now, going back to the world, here's the probability of dying before five. And if you want to avoid death in middle age, the first thing is to avoid dying before you're five. So it used to be at about 1950 death rates that a quarter of all the kids in the world would die before they were five. By 1970, that's the red numbers, 1970, 14% um, would die before they were five. And by 2010, it was down to 5%, and now it's about 4%. So enormous changes in the probability of dying before five. Um, and then that takes us on into middle age. Now, when we talk about deaths in middle age, I talked about 30 million deaths in middle age. Obviously, we're just in the middle of a COVID pandemic. And, you know, how many deaths has COVID caused so far? Well, so far, probably about 20 million deaths. Nobody knows exactly. And probably about a quarter of those deaths were before age 70 and about three quarters were over age 70. Nobody knows. We just don't know reliably enough, but something like that. So that'll be five million deaths in two years of the epidemic. So two or three million deaths a year before age 70. So that's a big contributor to the 30 million deaths a year before age 70, but it's less than 10% of it. Okay. Um, now, let's look at deaths at other ages worldwide. And what I want to do is to compare 1970, a year when we've got good statistics and, you know, after the great famines are mostly finished, um, and then 2010. So we've got reasonably good statistics on numbers of deaths in various ages at 1970 death rates and at 2010 death rates. And this is just overall global probabilities of dying at various ages. And across the bottom, we've got age. So here's age five, here's age 50, and here's age 70. And at a death before age five, as we already said, 14% worldwide at 1970 death rates, 5% worldwide at 2010 death rates are now about 4%, like print back in 1960. But look at the deaths, the probability of dying before you're 70, 54% down to 36%. Well, of course, the death before age five helps, but it's not the only thing. So overall, the probability of death in middle age has gone down, dying in middle age, well, dying before you're 70, has gone down from 54% to 36%. That's a reduction of one third. And if it would go from, if it could be halved, then that would take from 36% down to 18%. And these red squares down here are Britain in 2010. So if the world get, could get British death rates, then we'd have 18% dead before 70 instead of 36% dead before 70. And that's the same sort of change as we had between 1970 and 2010. This isn't inconceivable if we take the big causes seriously. It's the big causes. You can avoid far more deaths by a moderate reduction of big cause than by a big reduction of small cause. And of course, by the age of 100, everybody's dead. And it's, you know, if we do avoid death in middle age, if we do reduce the risk of death in middle age, yes, we're going to have more people alive in their 70s and more people alive in their 80s, but not so much absolute difference in the people in their 90s and virtually no difference at all among people in the hundreds. You know, at the age of 100, the death rate, even in rich countries of the world, is about 50% per year. So you're, if you're age 100, you've only got a 50% chance of making it to 101. And you've got less than one in a 1,000 chance of making it to 110. So we're not going to fill the world up with centenarians. And yes, there'll be more people in old age, and there'll be more people requiring care. But of course, the avoidance of the causes of death in middle age also avoids a lot of the causes of disability, a lot of the dementia in old age is caused by vascular disease, it's vascular dementia. So if we do things to reduce vascular mortality, 
then we're going to reduce vascular disability, particularly cerebral vascular disability, dementia. So you can, you can greatly reduce um, the, the risks, not only the, the, the age-specific disability rates, by reducing the avoidable causes of chronic disease. Okay, so that's the aim. Now, I want to choose, um, and obviously, you know, this is the world. The world is a very different place. So I've just chosen the 25 biggest countries. I want to talk about death in this age range, say 50 to 70. And I've chosen this range because it's a bit older than most of the HIV deaths. It's a bit aged, older than most of the deaths from violence and accident. It's a bit older than the deaths of childhood and so on. So I want to, and this is the area where the chronic diseases of middle age predominate, the cancer, the vascular disease, stroke, you know, um, chronic obstructive lung disease. So three quarters of the deaths in this range are from non-communicable diseases. And the communicable ones, the chief communicable ones are TB and pneumonia. Okay, and of course, there's still some deaths from accidents, violence and suicide in this age range as well, but predominantly three quarters of it is non-communicable disease. It, again, it's not the only thing that matters. I'm just, you know, gonna talk briefly um, in order to, just in order to well, give an introduction to Sarah Lynch and is gonna talk more about various other aspects of, of um, chronic disease control. I want to just illustrate what particular studies in particular countries can do to, um, to make things better. Because, and I'm going to choose, start with a rather remarkable study done by David Zeridzi in Russia. Because Russia had this enormous increase in premature deaths um, in the 1990s after communism collapsed. What was the reason? So David Zeridzi took all of the deaths in three big cities in, um, during the 1990s, actually from the period of 1990 to 2001, went knocking on the doors to ask the surviving family members what the dead person used to drink. And if you want to know what a Russian man drinks, and you just ask, ask his wife after he's dead, she'll tell you. And so they, they went, and I want to illustrate the results of this. I want to illustrate the problem and illustrate the results. This is a particular study of a particular cause in a particular country. But first I want to start off with saying, well, and I'm going to just now look at deaths in this range here, 15 to 54. So just I'm going back a bit first before I go into 50 to 70. Um, here we've got, oh, sorry, just, sorry, just rearrange things. These are the trends in mortality um, in middle age from 1970 to, so here's the UK. So there's the UK 1970 death rates. There's the UK at, 21, at 2010 death rates. And you can see the probability of dying in uh, probability that a 50 year old will die before 70. So I'm the probability of a 50 year old will die before 70 went down from about 30% down to about 13%, something like that. And similar changes in the US, similar bigger changes in China and bigger improvements in China. And here's all the other, these are the 25 biggest countries in the world. And these are the trends in each of them in mortality in middle age. And here's South Africa going down up because of HIV and then down again because of HIV control. Nigeria, really no net progress. And even in the Al Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, in Myanmar, in India, look at the changes, look at the favorable changes. And the one thing that stands out is this extraordinary change, this extraordinary increase and then decrease in Russia. And this is predominantly effects of alcohol or vodka, village distilled vodka as well as officially sold vodka. But the overall picture is one of improvement, except where things like war, HIV or vodka predominate. So it's improvement despite all sorts of other things going wrong. And in a very big range, these are the 25 most populous countries in the world. Um, stop that red light flashing, it's not due yet. Um, okay, alcohol, alcohol in Russia. So here we start with the UK, um, 1980 to 2016. Uh, now these are the trends in mortality in the United Kingdom, male and female, this is the probability at 1980 then to 2010 death rates of somebody aged 15 dying before 55, male, female. Now here's the same thing, looking at the females, I'll contrast British females with Russian females. And there you see, that's where Gorbachev restricted alcohol, that's where communism collapsed and alcohol went up. That's when the situation stabilized and alcohol went down. That's where the ruble collapsed and alcohol went up. And then that's the stability since about 2005 where there's been this big improvement in female death rates in Russia, but there's just these wild fluctuations due to variation in alcohol consumption. Then here's the same thing on the same scale for males. It's just crazy. I mean, here we've got about 
a third of the male population aged 15 would die before 55 at some Russian, at the Russian death rates of the early 2000s. It's just, and then there's the similar peak in the 1990s. And the study that was done then went asking people who, you know, what they, what their family member used to drink. And they finished up concluding that the people who drink a bottle of vodka a day as against less than one bottle a week, that was the control group, had a four times the risk of dying from traffic accidents, six times the risk of dying of accidents, eight times the risk of dying from suicide, and 10 times the risk of being murdered. It's just crazy. So, so that would go back from Russia to the world. So the main cause of the 18 million deaths per year at ages 35 to 69, sorry, 18 million deaths per year, that's right, sorry, 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 is at 35 to 69, is of which, and then there's another 12 million before 35, three quarters non-communicable disease. Okay. Now, what are the causes? And again, I want to go to simple studies of non-communicable disease. This is the UK million women study. Ask a million women what they smoke, and then just say, take their answers, and you plot risk of death versus number of cigarettes she says she smokes. And you can see, you get, if, you, if you're a light smoker, you're twice as likely to die in middle age. And if you're an average smoker, you're three times as likely to die in middle age. And if you're a heavy smoker, then you're four times as likely to die in middle age as a non-smoker would be. Okay, now, why is this important? We know about smoking. We've known about smoking for half a century. Well, it's because that the relative importance also comes out from these simple studies. There's all sorts of things about stress and you know, type A personalities and happiness and things like that that are supposed to be relevant. But the million women study asked people how much stress they'd got and how happy they were. It's interesting to compare the two. They're on the left. How often do you feel happy? Most of the time, usually, sometimes, rarely or never. Relative risk 1.0, 1.0, 1.0. It doesn't matter. It's said to be very important and it doesn't matter. And there's the smoking graph for comparison. A single question in both cases, see which one predicts death. Don't mix up the big causes and the small causes. For that, we really need to get the epidemiological evidence right. There's claims about all kinds of nutritional factors, you know, eating more legumes, eating more fruit and vegetables, eating, I don't know what. And these things are very poorly justified. I think their relative risks might not be far away from the 1.0 that's claimed, but these are, there's so many claims made about them. They divert attention from the big causes. We've got to sort out what's the big cause and what's the small cause. And smoking still, even in countries where the effects have decreased enormously, is the biggest cause there is still to deal with. Big risk for smokers, the good news is that stopping before age 40, preferably well before age 40, avoids more than 90% of that risk. In fact, if you stop before th at 30, you'll avoid 97% of the risk. Again, this comes to the Million Women study. And overall, worldwide, smoking is still something of the order of 8 million deaths a year, something like that, 6, 8, and you could argue about it, certainly more than COVID over the last two years. Um, and we've had about 100 million deaths from smoking this century already. Over the next 30 years, 2020 to 2050, we're going to have about 250 million at present smoking patterns, partly because of population growth. Um, and in the second half of the century, if we keep on as we are, with one third of the young adults starting to smoke and most of those who start not stopping, we're going to finish up with more than 100 million per decade, more than 500 million in this 50 year period. So making a total of about a billion deaths this century, if we just keep on the way we are, compared with 100 million tobacco deaths last century. This, you know, I'm not saying COVID doesn't matter, it really does, but we, this also matters. And we, we, there've been no headlines on tobacco over the last two years, compared with multiple headlines on COVID. Both matter, but they're both big and tobacco is bigger. What can we do about it? Well, the big thing that we should be doing about it is price and availability. Two countries, South Africa and France, tripled the price of cigarettes over a 15 year period. Consumption halved and the real tax yield doubled. They made more money. I'm now on my last slide coming. So worldwide, government profit and tax on tobacco is about $300 billion a year. WHO target is to get smoking down by a third by 2030. Well, if that goes down at constant prices, the governments of the world are going to lose 100 billion a year. That's not big money, but it's not small money. And, but if they tax them so that the real price doubled, then that alone would knock smoking down by a third. And the governments would actually, at the same time as smoking going down, would gain about $100 billion a year in revenue. So get the big numbers right. Before COVID, tobacco, HIV, alcohol, adiposity and war, these things 
Well, the only big pause is that it fluctuated substantially since 1990 in some large populations after allowing for population growth. So I'll now hand over to Sarah Lewington to present some results of other studies and the relevance of studies to what is being done here.